There are three node groups inside of the Comic Shader Lite for Eevee. One base node and two texture nodes. Uh, to apply them is really, really simple. Uh, let's just go to a, a demo file here uh, where we can make some materials from scratch in order to show you uh, how to import these nodes and then how to create materials. This scene has no materials, but it does have some in-scene lighting. Okay, I've got some uh, various lamps here, which are illuminating this object from various directions, and a couple of cameras uh, to take a look through. I'll just take off the scene lights for now. I'm gonna split this screen vertically, and I'm gonna change this left-hand screen to shader editor, and we don't need our side box there. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and make a new material. So there's a new material with just a principled BSDF. One more thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select everything and then hit Control L to uh, link all of the materials. So every time that the material changes on one, uh, it's going to change on all of them. Now let's go ahead and append our node groups. If we go to File, Append, and go to where we've got our comic shader light file. I'm going to append that. Uh, the old way of doing it was to go to the materials folder and select the comic shader light material. Now you can still do that and that will import the comic shader light material with all the nodes set up already. But the better way to do it is to open up the node tree folder and just import the nodes. Select them all and click append. Now, when we're in our shader window, we can delete this principled BSDF shader, select that and hit X, and we can go Shift A, and under Group, now we'll have our three node groups show up. So let's start with the base EV shader, and uh, let's take a look at some of the settings that we've got in this shader here. Now, in order to see what's going on, I'm going to bring in these lights. So the lights are now active, Okay, we've got a sun lamp, and we've got a few other lights here. Uh, I'm just going to switch these ones off, just hide them for a second so that we've just got one lighting source so that we don't have to confuse things too much. Now, this light source will affect how the material uh, ends up working. You can see that this light actually has a color. It's got this nice orangey color. It's got a strength of 10. It's got shadows enabled. And if we drop the count, you'll see on the Cascade Shadow Map, you get very soft shadows. If you do this, what you're going to need to do is under your render property settings in Eevees, under shadows, you're gonna to have to make sure that you've got soft shadows enabled as well as high bit depth. Now, if we have those disabled, we can just work with some sharp shadows. Okay, so let's turn those off just for now uh, so that we can work with the materials uh, with a very basic light. This material, let's call comic uh, metal, let's say, because we'll make a met metallic material here. The node group CSL Base EV has got a number of controls. The first and most obvious is, of course, color. If we click on that, we can choose pretty much any color we want. So I'm gonna get a nice mid-blue for that. We've got this control here called light color factor. And if we bump this up, what you're going to notice is that the light color begins to take over. And remember how this lamp has got this golden color? Well, now it's coloring this object with that sort of golden light. And we can already see how those shadows are starting to uh, work a little uh, over time. So maybe what we might do is, let's see if we can go high bit depth soft shadows, and uh, let's just bump up the count on these shadows uh, up to four. So now we've got uh, variation on those shadows. So what you can see here is that there are the shadows cast by the lamp and the shadows created by the shader. In order to not confuse things, let's turn off shadows just for now so we can just work with the shadows created by the shader, okay. Uh, we've got this next control, which is metallic, and we can bump this up. And what that does is just sharpen the highlight 
until we get these really, really sharp highlights to make something look super metallic. And what's, what we're seeing reflected right now is because we're in material shading, we haven't got the scene world reflecting. If we did that, it would be 100% whatever the scene color is. We've got the scene world uh, matte cap. So we could change that matte cap to something super reflective, something like this, for instance, okay? And so the metallic basically uh, switches out to uh, get that reflectivity in there. So you can have it just a little bit metallic to get a little bit of reflection in there uh, and, you know, flatter lighting or shading. Okay, this will have no reflection uh, whatsoever or we can get it a little bit metallic. So let's just bump that up to maybe about a two. Now, the next setting, uh, if we take this light setting off for now, so we've just got our color, is the shadow softness. Now you see how the shadow is very starkly delineated from the lighting area, okay? If we begin to soften up that shadow, it blurs that out so we can get a soft shading, almost like a diffuse pass. And this also works in conjunction with, say, the light factor there. So we can have a sharp shadow and the light factor will sort of give us these sort of softer highlights, or we can have a really soft shadow to, to get some diffuse lighting in there. We can also intensify this shadow. So if we had no light factor whatsoever, uh, we can just bring in the intensity of that shadow all the way up to 100%, which is black. So we can have very sharp, dark shadows, or we can have soft, dark shadows or soft, you know, less intense shadows. And finally, we've got this shadow color here. So you can actually colorize your shadows to get a bit of a brighter effect if you wanted to. Okay, so you can get this nice two-tone uh, look, or we can sort of drop that shadow intensity to get a bit of blending in there and say have brighter colored shadows in there. Now the rim size, which was set to 0.2, what that does is it actually etches out a rim around the silhouette of the object. So I'm just gonna go over to the shadow side to see show you how this works. You can see how that etches away at that shadow there, right? And the rim intensity brings up the color of that rim. And so you can have a very slight rim to get this sort of uh, bounce light effect, okay? Or a very thick rim if you wanted something that looks a li little bit more metallic, okay? And you can drop the intensity of that color as well. Now, the shadow color and rim intensity work independent of the light color factor. So we could actually have 100% colored lighting and we can also color that rim something uh, completely separately as well as the shadow. And so we've got control over all of those properties in order to get something that uh, will give you a range of comic style effects. Now, if we bring back those other lamps, you'll also see that other lighting will also affect the surface. So if we say bring this purple light uh, around, you can see that you can light it from almost any angle. And again, the types of lighting, if the shadows are enabled, you're going to get different shadows or different effects based on whether those lights are meant to cast shadows or not. And so that's just the base shader, okay? So let's, let's give this a nice sort of pink rim to go along with the pink lighting. Now, we have two textures. We've got the halftone texture, and we have the sketch lines texture, but let's just focus on the halftone for now. In order to see the halftone at work, let's just connect the shadow output from the base EV to the halftone color input and then get that output to our material output. Uh, again, what we might do is turn off these extra point lights. So we've just got one lighting source and already you can start to see it working. Now by default, I've got this control called PO switch set to one. And what the PO stands for is perspective orthographic. So right now, the halftone texture, if we go to orthographic view, let's say front view, and let's drop the scale of those dots down, you can see, the, and the, the dot ratio as well, you can see that those dots look correct in orthographic view. 
if we were to just turn around in you know, isometric or orthographic. But as soon as we go into perspective, they looked a little off. That can be corrected by clicking this to zero, and now the dots should look correct for a perspective view, which is what we're looking through the camera on. Now, the ratio is set to a standard camera of, say, 50 millimeters, and so the dots will look sort of the same size at 50 millimeters for the corresponding orthographic view. But should you use a wider lens or a narrower lens, that ratio of dot is going to change, which means that the scale will also have to be adjusted um, for that. But that's the, the one caveat with this. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking a shadow output, so I'm just gonna intensify that shadow to 100% so we can see what we're doing. Right, so this is a very soft shading situation, so we can get a nice variation in dot size, where we have very large white dots in the highlight areas, uh, going to very small white dots etching into the darker areas. Now the dot ratio, if we were just to disconnect this for a second, okay, and I set this up to one. What that dot ratio is symbolizing, let's say we drop this right down so we can see nice big dots, is the ratio of how much the dot takes up in the square it occupies. So if you can see this as a grid, let's turn off the rotation for instance, okay? You can see that the dots are almost exactly adjacent, okay? So the dot ratio is a little bit under one, so we're really looking at, say, 11 uh, is where it's at one, but say one is sort of taking up 100%, and so if we drop that down, that's about 10% of each of the squares. However, if we invert it, what we have to do is bump this up to about a 1.2 before we start to see the black dot in the white space and we have to bump this all the way up to something like 2.2 uh, to get it to about you know 10% or, or less. So we can have very, very small black dots on an inverted thing. So the dot ratio actually has to be higher for an inverted value. Let's just leave this at uh, uh, the, its default 0.5 for now. Let's bring that shadow input of soft lighting so that we can see what happens. So uh, when it's invert uh, at zero, we've got white dots etching into the black, and when we invert that to one, we have black dots etching into the white. And we can just change up the ratio depending on the look that you want with your half tone. So let's uh, increase that a little or decrease it so we just get a little bit of uh, light dots there. And let's bring up that scale again so we can get you know, a much finer looking half tone pattern on this. And then let's rotate this around to maybe 45 degrees so we get a nice halftone look. Now, this halftone can sit right on top of your combined output. And by dropping down the saturation, you can just basically have a desaturated halftone over your total result, which is really, really good for, say, highlights like this, where you know we're sort of getting to that sort of Spider-Verse look and let's just uh, drop the shadow intensity a, a little, maybe up the metallicity a little bit as well. And now why don't we introduce our second texture, Shift A, Sketch Lines. Again, I'm going to connect the shadow output here and then output the sketch lines on their own so we can focus in on the sketch line settings with the same uh, shadow that we've got for the other one. I'm just gonna click on that shield as well. And let's go through some of these controls. We've got a line frequency, which is how many lines across the face of the mapped on surface. So you can bump these right up to get some very fine sketch lines, for instance. Let's leave it at 50 just so it's not too eye bleedy on our screen and we can sort of see what the rest do. Now, at rotation zero, we get these horizontal lines and we can rotate those around um, to 180 degrees one way and minus 180 degrees the other way. So if you want, say, something like a negative 45 or a 45, we can do that or, you know, say a 30 degree line or something like that. Now, the line thickness basically will thin out the lines, which means that at a very low setting, it's almost non-existent. Now, it's uh, probably existing 
right in the cracks of the, you know, sort of the deepest shadows of this model. Uh, but if we start bringing them in, we can see how they sort of etch into the highlight until we can get some very, you know, dark or absolutely blacked out uh, results. And so just sort of set to say like a 0.4 in this instance uh, works pretty well. Uh, we might sort of bring that back a little bit further for the purposes that we want. Um, and also now we've got this line roughness, which I may have to adjust, but this is to make it look a little bit more sketchy. So like uh, a bit more random, it just introduces a bit of noise in there. And uh, again, we've got a PO switch and we've got a saturation setting so that we can desaturate it uh, over whatever shadow uh, mat we've got. Now, in this case, we can see that the line thickness will etch it away from the terminator of this shadow, which is sort of what we want if we want to bring it over this halftone result over here, where we've got these dots, these halftone dots. Let's just make those slightly larger so we can see them. Uh, and I'm just going to use a color mix node here to mix this over using a multiply. We can sort of see the darker shadow lines in there. So let's bring up the frequency there. Okay, we can drop that factor again. And because this is a little bit dark because of the way that the halftone is being treated over this, we could probably do the same thing by um, combining the color output and uh, this halftone using the shadow output as its input to get a better result. Just to show you how that might work, let's just duplicate this, set that to add. Let's bring our color output into our first operation, our shadow output into our halftone operation. Let's bring this into our second operation as an add and this into our first operation here. Now, we can bump that saturation right up. Maybe if we set this to screen, would that be better? Might do. And then we'd have to tweak a few more of these settings here. Inverting it is actually having a better result, uh, but we can set this back to maybe add. And let's bring in those other lamps to really accentuate what's going on. And uh, you can already sort of start to see how this is beginning to work. I don't want any line roughness, actually. Uh, and so now what we've got is some uh, highlight area dots. Let's increase the ratio a little bit uh, in those highlighted areas. And we've got uh, the sketch lines in the shadow areas. Uh, maybe if we set this to something like darken might be a bit more intense. And so this is just an example of what you can do with the three nodes that are available in the Comic Shader Light. Thanks for watching guys, and I really hope uh, that it helps you with your comic style projects.